this is Nino Reyes, and we are on Keeping It Chill. And today I have Ken Hamlin with me, who is a former NFL football safety. Um, so yeah, today we're going to be talking about his journey from playing with the Seattle uh, Seahawks and, uh, you know, from the NFL draft, from you playing collegiate mm-hmm. sports, from just your whole journey. I'm interested in, like, where yeah. did you find out that you wanted to play ball professionally, um, where you are today? I know you have a cigar company, so we're going to be talking about that and so on. So, uh, Ken has played for the Dallas Cowboys, the Baltimore Ravens, and the Indianapolis Colts, right? Did I miss anything? As well as the Seattle. Well, I started with the Seattle Seahawks. That's who I actually got drafted with. Okay. Um, And from there, I went to Dallas. Uh, So, I was in Seattle for four years, um, Dallas for three years, and then I went to uh, Baltimore for a year and well, half a year, and then I finished up in Indianapolis. Okay, cool. So, yeah. when did you realize that this was what you wanted to pursue? That you wanted to pursue football and that you wanted to do this professional? Like, was it as a kid? Well, probably. Well, you know, we always felt like. Everybody had the whole peewee ball where you're playing football, that type of stuff. And I, I was – I started playing football when I was around seven. Um, okay. Uh, but I, I played other sports too. And um, actually baseball was one of my best sports. But growing up, uh, playing – being successful in all of them, um, I played four sports going up, going, uh, growing up in high school and um, had a success in all of it. But I was – I think because of what school I went to and how things were were done, I I got more attention and got the scholarship uh, for football, and that sort of just that that sort of directed me that way a little bit more than anything. Okay. And then from there, um, just started setting goals, started um, uh, you know making them high as possible. And when you start reaching some of them goals, it just start to you know, the 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 window of opportunity starts to open a little bit more of, of the possibility of, of making it to the NFL. And um, so, I mean, even even up to draft day, it was still a shock that you know, and I was, it didn't it didn't hit me like, oh wow, like I'm in the NFL now. So, it, it I I worked I worked I worked, and um, you know, once I got to that level, uh, it was all about just setting new goals and trying to go reach them too. So just keeping a chip on my shoulder and just trying to make sure that I never, I never just took it easy or, or took a break or felt like this was enough. Gotcha. And I think that's the one thing that sort of got me to that level. Okay. So you're from, you're from Memphis, right? Yeah. So um, crazy. I was, I was actually born in Germany. Um, Raised in Memphis, um, but we bounced around a little bit here and there before, like in between. Um, so I can remember actually starting like preschool in in Germany, and initially starting to learn German and all that type of stuff. And then uh, my dad was in the army, so he got shipped out, came back to the states, and then uh, I haven't been back that way um, since. But I think that's what sort of has me loving loving the fact of traveling too. But yeah, so Memphis is 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 home, but I've been I've been everywhere really. Got you. So how did your parents play uh, a role in your career as an athlete? Because a lot of times, you know, like it's usually parents or someone that is guiding you and yeah. helping you to be disciplined, or they see the dream, right? Um, and this is not for everybody's uh, mm-hmm. cases. There's different scenarios, right? But did they play a big factor in your journey and in your success? Well, I think, uh, you know, uh, just being disciplined, um, I mean, a lot of it wasn't uh, in the good the good way, but I think my dad, his discipline and how he uh, he disciplined uh, me and my, my siblings and how he just – it was sort of like a, a, a no BS type of thing where um, that sort of, that, that actually helped me um, to where I wasn't, you know, able to be in the streets. I wasn't able to, you know, slack on this, that, and the other. I wasn't able to slack on my grades. I wasn't, you know, so, I mean, the fear factor was, was, was pretty tough to where, 
you couldn't you couldn't go down that direction. Um, and if you did, whatever, then you know what the you know what the penalty was. So I think that was a big factor. I think also whatever you know, I had other people who played like the the dad role or the or the you know, sort of like uh, mentor role mm -hmm. that that made it. Just gave me another outlet and gave me something to really look forward to, and uh, you know, someone to talk to, and and uh, you know, someone that pushed me. So my 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 football coach, my high school coach, he actually crazy. He just passed away two days ago. Um, he was another person who was in my life who always pushed me and always, you know, always was always there for me too. And we had a different type of relationship. It was it was never the crying your shoulder type of thing, but it was always somebody that I knew I could I could lean on for certain things. So. There was always somebody there. It's just, and I think that with with people in general, there's always an outlet or or someone to be that outlet. But a lot of times, you don't open your eyes to really see it. You don't really open your eyes to really understand who it is or what it is. Um, and sometimes it's too late, whatever, when you actually figure it out. But uh, yeah. it's it's always I feel like it's always something there if, if the uh, if that person really really you know really wants it. And did your parents want you to take that path? Like, did they want you to become a, a professional athlete? <laughs> no, my my <laughs> mom couldn't stand that I played football. She <laughs> she she was a nervous wreck uh, every, at every game uh, she came to. It, it was it was bad to see. I mean, I had to like calm her down from the stands. So, no, I don't think that that was one thing that she was just like, yeah, I want you to play. So it, it you know seeing her and seeing her go through the nervous the whole ups and downs. It, yeah. it, it was, it was, it was tragic. Um, <laughs> and my dad, it was my, my dad, it, it was, oh yeah. Cause I mean, I mean, you look in the stands and you see her like in a nervous wreck and then you're like, calm down. Like, you know, yeah. I'm in the game. So, you know, I should actually be the one that's a little bit more, mm -hmm. but um, I mean, I know she enjoyed it, uh, you know, just in a different sense uh, because I was reaching the goals and doing the things that I wanted to do and, and reaching some of the, the different, uh, plateaus that I wanted to reach, um, but as far as the game goes, yeah, she she didn't she didn't like football, and um, and my dad, I mean, it, it, he really didn't push me one way or the other. I mean, I really, even at Pee Wee Ball, I had to you know for, to get registration all that. I had to go cut yards and and go go you know rake leaves to get the money to to, to play football or baseball or whatever it was. Mm. My dad didn't, my dad wasn't about, oh, I'm going to pay for you to play this, pay that. No, if you want to play, go get the money to play. But that showed that you... And that sort of... Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, and it, and it gives you, it gives you a little bit, sense, a little bit more, you know, a sense of, of, of pride for that, for that craft. Um, and then, of course, giving up or quitting whatever wasn't an option either. So it wasn't like that I was going to sit there. I mean, my dad, went, it was, they weren't going to allow me to quit, but... I paid for this, so, that's, so I mean, I like yeah, this is this is like what I want to do. It wasn't like somebody was pushing me to get into it. I did it because I wanted to do it, so it made it a little bit more special. So um, those sports, I mean, I, I, I like I said, I've been playing since I was seven years old. I think about it now. I'm like, man, I mean, I, most of my life so far has been, you know, involved in sports and and running around. So the last few years of being able to relax is actually uh, is actually a beautiful thing. Mm -hmm. So my other question for you is, what made you choose football instead of baseball? You say you were good at baseball, so why did you not take that route? Yeah. I think it was more just on the um, – so, look, I, I grew up in Memphis. Um, if people know, like, my school and the background and, and the, the type – of I guess hood that I grew up in there wasn't that much direction like from the coaches uh especially mm -hmm. our, our baseball coach was appointed in a in a board meeting they just said okay you're coaching baseball so he wasn't a guy that was you know the 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 growing up football I mean a baseball coach that knew everything and this and the other so it was a lot of times where he would ask me what should this guy play or who should pitch and what, you know, that type of stuff. So <laughs> there wasn't no real structure. Yeah, exactly. I just, all, my whole question, all, my answer most of the time was just not me. So, um, <laughs> so there wasn't that much structure. So as far as having someone who had, you know, the input and stuff on what, you know, what the next step was in baseball and, you know, and I, I my only thing was, okay, I got a scholarship in football. 
I'd probably have to go through the whole farm system in, in baseball and who knows, you know, from double A to triple A to whatever, whatever. So um, I, I just, I think taking the scholarship was, was going to be the best route. So that's what I took. Got you. Okay. Yeah. So you also played football um, at the University of Arkansas. What mm -hmm. was your experience at that school like? And did you have distractions like, like, you know, the women chasing after you. A lot of times when you're an athlete, you know, it comes with, like, all the craziness. And a the, lot of, the, a and lot the of glamorous, baggage. Like, right? <laughs> <laughs> what was that like you know what? college, like? Um, it was definitely, I mean, okay, so Memphis and Arkansas, University of Arkansas, they're, like, four hours away. So it's not that far. Mm -hmm. um, but it's night and day compared to, you know, Memphis, predominantly black, you know, I mean, really, like, the southern type of um, city. And then to go to Arkansas, being on campus, it's a predominantly white school, but, you know, you have your mixtures here and there. But, the, I mean, of course, you're a young guy, whatever, 17, 18 years old, you're coming on campus, and you are – so Arkansas football is like the Arkansas's NFL team. Like, so it's, it's bigger, you know, so, so it's on a whole nother scale when you think about the other cities that have colleges, but they have NFL teams too. And so like Arkansas, Arkansas, community Arkansas community supports also you guys as well, right? Yeah, it's all about Razorback football. That's it. They don't have anything bigger than that, whatever. So it, there is no, no Major League Baseball or Major League Basketball or Major League Football. It, it's Arkansas football. So gotcha. um, and Arkansas sports in general. So that made it even bigger to where you, know, you wear that, you know, you wear that hog on your helmet. It, it, it comes with a little bit. So, so when you say distractions, I mean, there, <laughs> you got to know how to balance it out. You got to know how to, you got to know how to really balance out. Okay. You know, if I'm a party to three, I know I got to be up at six. I got class at seven. I got practice at two. I got this, this. you know, I mean, Oh yeah, there was plenty of times where sleep was not a part of the equation. We just got to go get it in. So mm -hmm. coming back in town, partying here, you know, and then of course, I mean, it's it's uh, it's new to all of us, you know, that, that are just coming into college. So I mean, you're really trying to find your way and find your lane and that whole thing. And then of course, still trying to make the team, uh, you know, be successful on the field, you know, everything else, as well as school. Cause now, it's on a, yeah. <laughs> oh my God, yeah. So you gotta actually go to class. I mean, so it's like, oh wait a minute, hold on. <laughs> I got, yeah. So it, it it it's a it's a balancing act, really. Cause, I mean, for me, I never I never like uh, if I ever went back home, it was only for a weekend. Mm -hmm. Most people that don't play sports, whatever, they're back home for the summer. They're back home for you know whatever spring break. Whatever. No, we there we there all the time we're there practicing working out something we have something going on with football basically all year round to where yeah. we don't leave campus so so it, it that's home so you make sure that that home is is comfortable and you make sure your home is 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 a fun place to be and i i think that's the one thing that was surprising to me is how much fun we had on campus how much fun the guys had but it was a tight a tight group of guys um from the older guys to the, to, to the younger guys, whatever, they were on that team. Okay. So what kept you on your toes? You said it, it's all a balancing act. What was it that allowed you to, like, figure out that balance? Because a lot of times, I think a lot of people's downfalls – wow, it's getting dark. You saw that? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people's downfalls is the fact that – um they can't balance, right? A lot of people don't know how to manage their time. A lot of people don't know how to go to that party and then be at, you know, their, their practice in the morning instead they'll oversleep. So what kept you on yeah. your trip? What, what, where, where did you find that balance to um, be successful at everything from, from your social well, life to playing sports to academics? Well, I, I guess it's because the end, the end goal was always the same. The end goal was always, you know, I want to dominate on this field. I mean, so when I first got to college, um, I redshirted. And um, for those that don't know, that's basically you, you come to college, but you don't play your first year. Mm -hmm. And you, you don't, it, it's, not, it's not credited against you. So you still have that year. But you get to sort of get your body right, get your mind right and everything. So I, I was able to redshirt my first year. Um, but that entire year, every time I practiced, I went at the older guys. 
I win it guys, whatever that, that were so-called the best on the team, whatever, because I, I had this chip on my shoulder, like I can play with you. You know, I can, I can actually go up against you, whatever. So that, and, and, you know, it got me in trouble numerous times, whatever, in practice, but Hey, I mean, it, it, you, you have to, I mean, I was all about coming in and making a name for myself and coming in and, uh, and making an impression. And, um, you don't do that by just, you know, just being a, being a good guy sometimes, especially when you play defense. I mean, that's, that's not what it's about. And especially not then when it was all about knocking people's heads off. So that's, that's one thing that, uh, we, me and me and a couple of my boys, we look forward to. So you have I think to that's the biggest thing is that regardless of, oh yeah, for sure. The com competition was mm -hmm. always there. I, mean, I don't care what we're doing. The competition was always there. So I think coming in and just understanding that, understanding that regardless on if I'm partying, regardless if I'm doing this, that, and the other, you know, I got to still put it in on this field. Gotcha. I got to still make sure that I'm eligible. I got it because my end goal is to go here. So I can't let any of these other things slack. And um, I mean, it, trust me, sometimes it ain't, it, it ain't the easiest decision because it's so much, it's so, so easy, especially like you got summer, you're in summer. So you got summer classes. It's not really that important. I mean, so, cause you can take them again, whatever it is, but, <laughs> You know, you got to make sure, you got to find a way to be like, you know what, there is no, okay, you know what, forget it. Because a lot of times you can lay there in bed and be like, you know what, I just missed that class. And, and it doesn't have an, a direct effect on you, but eventually it's going to have an effect on you down the line because that one time could turn into two, to four, to six, to, and then you end up failing the class, so you end up doing something else. So I think it's just, and that's what, even with people now, I tell them like, as far as like we're working now, stuff like that but like you 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 take that one rep off you take that one day off you all that stuff eventually starts building up to where you know because you because mm -hmm. okay it felt better not to do that one okay you know what i felt better when i didn't work you know and then you continuously start finding excuses to do it it's all about just not finding that excuse and don't let it and don't let it you know determine what you're going to be doing wow that was some gems right there that right there was like <laughs> key it's true because you know we are teaching Man. the topic we are creatures of habit. Yeah. If we if we don't keep up with a specific habit, then we start to slack off. Um, so you're absolutely right about that. That's true. That's where the discipline oh, yeah. comes in, right? Oh, so that comfort to... level, boy. Wait, what you said? I'm sorry. I said that comfort level, boy. It's like one of them one one of them uh one of them beds that's so comfortable. You just feel you just get comfortable <laughs> in there. You just start to be like, man. I ain't leaving. Yeah, so you got to make sure you can't get too comfortable in that bed. That's facts. That's facts. So um, in 2005, you had an altercation at a Seattle nightclub, which uh, caused you okay. multiple injuries that affected your football careers from, like, uh, I, mm -hmm. you had a skull fracture, and, like, you suffered from, like, blood clots and, and specific injuries. Can you share about that and, and how that also affected your career as a player? Well, I'm gonna start by saying what it wasn't. Um, I don't know, I, cause there's so many different multiple, like I guess stories about this, but it wasn't an altercation. We um, want your version. This was this is your truth. exactly. The part we're gonna, we we're get down to the yeah, get down to the, not the sports in the version or anything like that. But um, so I so Sundays, whatever after games, I had an event at a club that I would always do. Um, we played against Houston that day. We won, had a great game. Everything was, was beautiful. I had, uh, some friends in town and my brother in town went to my spot that I, that I do on Sundays. Um, it wasn't really jumping at night. So a couple of other teammates were talking about going to another spot downtown Seattle. And, um, so we went there. We're leaving the club. Club's not over with. It's still going on, but we're leaving the club. When we leave out the club, there is like it looks like an entirely different club going on right outside the door. Like that's how many people were outside the club. Um, I had um, I had my rehab uh, lady from Houston who came in town with her husband uh, to watch the game. I had a female friend of mine with me, two uh, two other female friends that I know whatever with me, and I had my brother and a couple other friends with me. Walking through a crowd, I'm holding their hand, whatever, walking through the crowd, I lose their hand. When I lose the hand, 
I reached back to grab, grab, grab the hand, whatever, to pull him through the crowd, and I touched this dude's hand. Mm. And the dude, the dude was like, hey, man, I ain't your B, blah, blah, blah. He starts running off at the mouth, going crazy. And after the fact, I see why he was real, real cocky and tough, because he had a whole bunch of people that he knew out there. So he was, he, he was, high, he was high on his horse that night. So mm -hmm. he, he comes to me with that. We, we're sitting there. I'm basically telling him what I was doing, whatever. And of course, I'm, I'm not liking the, 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 the fact that he jumping at me or whatever for touching his hand or whatever. But that goes to say whatever, that conversation is going on. Somebody sprayed pepper spray. Um, wow. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 it's, it was insane. So um, everybody's spreading. I'm up against the glass, whatever, covering my face. Um, when I come up off the glass, I look up and I, I'm, I see my brother. I guess he had ran across the street or something had happened, but he's across the street. My, my homeboy and my brother, they getting jumped by about 15, 10 to 15 people. Wow. I look up. I look up, I'm surrounded by about eight. Then I turn, whatever, there's nine. Then I turn and it just, that number continued to grow. And I was trying to, I was trying to actually, and then I got my people with me, whatever. And like, so I'm trying to back up and get them to come with me. Like, let's go, let's go. The car's around the corner. So I'm backing up. I'm trying to tell my brother to come on, come on, come on. And um, when we get to the corner, there was a guy hiding around the corner. He pistol with me, uh, tried to tried to shoot me, whatever. The, I mean, this this is all story. Like after the fact, whatever. Because I he, he knocked me unconscious when he pistol with me. Um, tried to shoot me, gun didn't go off, whatever the case may be. Um, and they started hitting me. They once once he pistol with me, they started hitting me and stuff, whatever. So that's where the fractured skull, blood clots, all that stuff came down. Um, yeah, it was, it, it, so it was more of a, <laughs> it was more of some insane types of stuff, whatever, compared to just, uh, just, uh, an, an encounter or, or a fight that just went wrong or whatever the case may be. It was more of, do you think you were set up? Like, they had something else. I don't know. Um, I just know that it was, it, it was definitely, you know, I, I, people are always talking about wrong place, wrong time, whatever, all that stuff, whatever. But it, it wasn't like we hadn't been in those areas or been in that area like numerous times before. So of course that, of course, at the end of the day, whatever, that timing was very bad. But um, we, like, I wasn't doing anything extra. I mean, it was sort of the same routine and 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 just getting out and relax and have a good time. But you can't you can't always say what's on somebody else's mind what what, what objective they have the guy that pistol with me he had just got out of jail um from for for manslaughter uh, was wow. in a halfway house was in a halfway house and was paying some paying the people from the halfway house to let him out at night so he was hiding his face and was on the cameras and stuff whatever so and then tragically not even an hour later somebody killed him so, wow. so it, it, it all like went downhill that entire night, or whatever, but that just started. Um, I mean, I was, of course, you know, my mom has to get a phone call at three, four o'clock in the morning, whatever, then her son's in the hospital. Um, I got blood clots, whatever, but I'm still not really physically knowing like what's really wrong with me. Cause I'm feeling like, you know, I got a headache. Cool. I've had headaches numerous times, whatever. Football. So like this ain't nothing normal. This ain't nothing like not normal. So I'm like, cool, I'm I'm good. Um so when they started talking about like you might not play football again, you might not do this, I'm like, yeah, that's not happening. <laughs> um but, like, yeah, but okay. not knowing I'm <laughs> yeah, cause cause I'm th I'm not knowing like the severity of the injuries because I, I you know, I'm waking up and they're like waking me up and they like talk to me. I'm like, why? Well, where the the fracture was is where my speech pattern was. They were making sure that I could still talk regularly and all this type of stuff. I'm not knowing all this stuff. And then you see the blood clots and you're like, wow, I mean, hopefully they go down, but I'm not knowing the severity of that either. Cause it's like, it, when you look at it, it looks crazy. Um, but 
I mean, I went about a month after that, whatever, straight headaches. I mean, like banging wow. headaches, whatever. I had to go see different type of like NASCAR type of type of uh, doctors who like deal with allergies. major head injuries. Yeah, they deal with major head head injuries and stuff. And that. so I finally, I mean, fast forward, you know, the, wor the worst part about it really was that the year, so that happened uh, Halloween weekend of that year. Mm -hmm. So I didn't play the rest of that year. That's the year we made it to the Super Bowl and lost to the Super Bowl. So wow. I wasn't able to contribute whatever with, with and the way that we lost in that game, uh, it just like crazy because that position, my position had a big impact in that game. And I wasn't able to actually be the part of it, whatever, to where it could turn it the other way around. So, so it, it, it was, uh, that was one of the, the downsides of, of that year. But I was able to come back the following year. Of course, I had to go through all type of clearances and, mm -hmm. you know, being held back from the team because they didn't know, they didn't want to rush me back in. But I made sure that the first practice I could actually, we, could, we had contact. I made sure to put my entire body into somebody to make sure that I knew that I could actually play against. So for me, it was, my focus was a lot better. My circle was a lot smaller. Um, <laughs> my, uh, you know, it, it was it, it was more, I mean, cause the, the, the crazy part about that night is that I had teammates that were out there that night. Mm. And uh, a lot of them didn't do anything. In 2007, since we're talking about you signing with, um, Dallas Cowboys, um, there were teams that were reluctant to offer you a multi-year contract because of concerns stemming your previous head injury. How did you feel about that? Like, what, yeah. what, how, how did that impact you? It was warranted. I mean, I, I, I get it. Uh, I mean, most people don't know that. So when I, when I visited New Orleans, I was a free agent, visited New Orleans, um, was there for like two or three days. I mean, I was there literally about to sign with New Orleans. Um, mm -hmm. Met with all the different type of coaches first day, a couple other coaches the next day. And then I go meet with the GM, uh, Mickey Loomis. And I go in his office, I'm meeting with him. I literally have a seizure on his floor. Oh, shit. Um, <laughs> yeah. What? So uh, it wasn't like, it, it wasn't like this wasn't like, uh, you know, something that they had concerns about. They they had every right to be concerned. Mm -hmm. I literally had a seizure right there on the floor. I woke up and I was in the hospital and I was like, and, and in my head, I'm thinking like, it's over. Like, I'm done. Like, this mm -hmm. is, this is, this is it. Um, and I actually flew from New Orleans to Dallas. Dallas flew me to Dallas from New Orleans. As soon as I got off the plane, took me straight to the hospital did all type of tests and everything on me. And that's when I signed the one year deal. Um, because of course I wanted a, I wanted a, uh, a multi-year deal. And I was gonna, I was gonna do like a three or four year deal with, with New Orleans before the fact. Um, after that, I was in Dallas, whatever, for like five days, they were trying to work out a contract where because of all the craziness going on. So mm -hmm. yeah, I knew, I knew only thing I probably could get was a one year deal after that. I mean, you. You have a seizure on, on a GS floor. That, that's not a. That's, that's not, not, not going to be promising. Yeah, that's not. That's not putting your best foot forward. So, uh, it was. It was idea. I mean, I, I. I got it. I understood. I understood mm -hmm. exactly where it coming from. But that's what sort of put that chip back on my shoulder that year to go out and just and try to go, basically ape shit crazy, um, and. Um, that year, we ended up having like thirteen guys, me me included, um, being being in the Pro Bowl for for Dallas. Okay, got you. Wow, what a what a journey, Ken. <laughs> oh man, look, <laughs> trust me. <laughs> like you just, <laughs> about I'm like, wow, that sounds like that was a lot. It was a lot going on. Um, oh, man. Sheesh. Now I want to talk about your cigar business. I don't really know much about it. Yeah. I tried to find info. I really couldn't couldn't get a lot. Oh yeah. So um, this well, is the part you're gonna share well, all about see, it. Okay. Yeah. So um, couple. Well, I've been smoking cigars for probably like 14, 15 years. Okay. Um, 
and um, got more serious as time went on of, of really like learning about tobacco, understanding what I'm smoking and this type of thing. So um, probably about four years ago, I really started getting the idea of, of I had bought some tobacco, some seeds, mm. and I grew some, grew some tobacco. So that sort of got me a little bit more intrigued about just everything involved in, in tobacco. So about three years ago, I went to uh, Santiago and mm-hmm. uh, went to the Pro Cigar out there, uh, started talking with, uh, you know, different different factory owners, different people in the business, you know, growers, master blenders. And I would go to a couple of the factories and I just, you know, let them know that I was interested in you know, possibly doing my own cigar. Well, me not knowing whatever that they were just going to be like, man, you want to come back up here? Let's, let's, let's do it. And I'm like, wow. So I got to, of course me, I told them, like, don't, don't, don't be surprised if you see me like in a week <laughs> and I booked another flight, came back up, started sitting into the fact, getting in the factories and spending all day in the factories, blending, smoking, blending, smoking, blending, smoking. Mm-hmm. And um, narrowed down who I was going to end up doing my cigar with, with La Aura. And then we just started just breaking down and seeing what we were going to do. I, that whole process was just like unbelievable to me because it's like just taking these things and putting them together and you find out what marries together with this, that, and the other. So it, it, it just blew my mind or whatever on that, on a whole nother level. Cause I already knew I smoked tobacco. I smoked uh, you know, cigars, but it's like, okay, now I'm on a whole nother side of it to where I'm actually learning. Why is this happening? Why is this going on? All this different stuff that's going on. So, um, then it got to the business side of it because, okay, now you got to come up with a name. You got to, you know, find the right blend. You got to understand why this blend is going to work with what, you know, and, and labels and all this type of stuff. So that actually was fun because I got to sit in a meeting for like five or six hours, like developing, you know, a label, uh, a box, or this or that, and um, concepts, and got to go back down there and do that's the one thing about it. I mean, you get to go back to DR and, and, and sit in the factory and smoke all day. I, I can do that all day long. I mean, so, uh, so I've gone to, um, within the last year, I've gone to Dominican, Nicaragua, Honduras, Cuba. Um, and I, I love like Nicaraguan tobacco. I love Honduran tobacco. I believe it was more of the relationship with La Aurora and the fact that Dominican, Dominican, Factories like La Aurora and just Dominican Tobacco has so many ranges. And then these factories aren't afraid to add from those other countries to make that cigar mm. even more of, of a complex cigar. So it's not about it just being all of just Dominican, but it, it has, like my, like my cigar that I'm creating now has Brazilian, Dominican, Nicaraguan, um, it had um and ecuadorian so like it has it has for so it's not about just because it's a dominican made to, uh, uh cigar that it's just all about dominican that's the best part about it is that cubans are cubans and they are only cubans that's it there's mm. nothing else in it okay. i love it that the fact that these these tobacco like the ones that we are blending the ones that we're putting together we're not afraid to go and get a you know an african like a cameroon uh you know go get Go get a Costa Rican. Go get, you know, you can go pull these different things and put them together to see what happens. Mm-hmm. Because you just never know. And um, mm-hmm. that's the crazy part about it. Yeah, because you'll get, you'll get one tobacco that has four different countries in it. And then you can take those same four different countries from that same tobacco and change the percentages of those, of what was in that last cigar into another one. And you got a whole different cigar. Because of just what it does. Just all, the, the changes that it does, whatever. It's so it's like, you know, people uh, people don't understand just how complex it can be. But when you start really paying attention to it, to, to a to actual cigar and see what it's doing, that's why you see so many people that are at the cigar lounge and they just kick back, relax, and they just enjoy themselves because mm-hmm. it's them and that cigar. It's that relationship right there, whatever. Because a lot of times you don't need to have a whole bunch of people around you to really enjoy yourself. You got that cigar, which is going to give you a story. 
and yourself. You can kick back, relax, and go into your own little world, and um, and just and just vibe. And that, that's that's, that's, that's what I enjoy doing. You're like uh, a hardcore cigar enthusiast. Like you, I, you could I, go out I there, like and prom- you could promo and market the shit out of this. <laughs> oh, I will be. I, I'll be. I'll be in New York. I'll be in Miami. I'll be in Atlanta. I'll. Oh, I'll be everywhere soon doing it. So don't so worry you about that. Out like a campaign or something for your brand. So I already have. So I already have basically everything laid out. I mean, I actually have a a minute video that we did the last time I went to, it's a cold piece of work too. It's, it's nice. nice. We did it uh, the last time I was in DR. Um, we put this put this video together. So it's almost like an intro to it. Um, so that once we actually get um, the okay to just like full out launch, which I'll be talking to them this week about, then uh, all of that stuff will be starting posted. I'll start posting on, on my page and the, the cigar page. Okay. Um, and just getting everything rolling. So yeah, but New York is New York is definitely on the on the map. Um, I got a few things working with some people out that way. Um, of course, Miami, um, Atlanta, hometown Memphis, basically everywhere. Cause I, mm-hmm. I got connections and, and relationships with so many people in so many different places. And it's like that's the one thing that's sort of you know I go to a different town. I got my cigars. And the exchange is happening. We sitting back smoking. We doing, you know, so we relax. And so it's a lot of different things. I always say that people like the, the cigars and the cigar lounge is almost like the golf course because you never know who you're really going to run into, what type of relationships, what type of business these people do, and how everything can come together. And um, you never know. Just introducing yourself to one person can change things. Well, you thank you. I feel like you know we touched on everything. Um, I asked you all the questions. I learned about your journey. I learned about where you started, where you, where you're yeah. trying to get, and where you currently are. So um, this was really informative. I feel like you know you learned people, about you learned about all of the roller coaster stuff. That's, that's yeah, 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 I did. And and the thing that's really good about this, you know, there's a lot of young people these days that need that kind of inspiration or that they need yeah. to hear some success stories because they don't understand sometimes the journey that it requires for people to go through, right? Um, in order for them to get there, a lot of people today are entitled. They think that things are supposed to be handed to them or it, that it's supposed to be easy. And a lot of times it's like, you need to hear from other professionals what their experiences were in order yeah. for you to understand like that would be a very similar journey to yours too, because that's what life is about, you know? Um, so no, kind of right no, now, like working on a series with um, people that do different things in different areas from media to, 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 to sports. Um, and I want to know about their path and like what they mm-hmm. have to do to get to where they are and so on. So, so thank you. It was I like it. I like it. I like the grind. I like it. <laughs> I appreciate yeah. you having me on. I appreciate you taking the time to hear from me. Yeah. And uh, no, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. That's nice. Thank you.